I'm Ann Carmichael and I'm the Student Financial Aid Consultant with Leela. And I hope that by the end of this presentation, you have a better understanding of the student financial aid process. As I'm sure your counselor has told you, the Louisiana Department of Education asks that the class of 2021 submit the free application for federal student aid as a requirement for graduation. And this simply ensures that your money is ready and waiting for you when you begin college in the fall. Because college can't be expensive, it's time to start preparing for those costs. And they include equipment, books and supplies like your textbooks, notebooks, a computer if you need one, your personal expenses like your phone bill, money for laundry, fuel for your car, and food purchases outside of your meal plan, room and board, which can include your dorm or apartment, and tuition and fees such as parking, library, technology, and athletic fees, and your campus transportation. So when you're looking for the cost of attendance on your college's websites, make sure you're taking into consideration all of these additional expenses as well. But the good news is that financial aid is available from the federal government, our state government, your college or career school, and then nonprofit and private organizations such as LELA. Every year, the federal government provides more than $120 billion in student financial aid. And we just wanna make sure that you are applying for and receiving your portion of that aid. The types of student aid include the Federal Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education Grant, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, Federal Work Study, and Direct Subsidized, Unsubsidized, and PLUS Loans. Federal student aid grants are a form of financial aid that does not have to be repaid. And that family of grants includes the Pell, it's for undergraduates with financial need. FSEOGs are for undergraduates with exceptional financial need. Service grants for students of military parents who died defending the country following 9-11 and TEACH grants for students pursuing a teaching career. The Federal Work Study Program provides part-time jobs to help you pay for your education expenses. So when you tell the financial aid office that you're interested in Federal Work Study, you'll be considered for this program. The money you earn will be paid directly to you and can be used to pay your miscellaneous college expenses. A federal work study job also looks great on your professional resume. Now direct subsidized loans are a um, form of loan that's based on financial need and no interest is charged until you graduate or cease to attend. On the other hand, almost everyone is eligible for the direct unsubsidized loans but remember that interest is accruing on this loan once it's fully dispersed, which is usually in the spring semester, and then throughout the life of the loan. So you can see that there's a big difference between the direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans. You always want to accept the subsidized loan portion first. And you can remember this by saying the U and unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest on that loan. If you are offered loans and you do find that you need to accept some to complete your academic year in college, always accept the federal student loans first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed at a lower rate and no credit check is required. Private loans should be accepted only as needed because most require payments be made while you're still in school. The interest rate might be variable and often much higher, and they almost always require a cosigner. 
So make sure you're doing your research when it comes to accepting loans. To dispel the myth, you can see that almost everyone is eligible for some type of federal student aid. And all federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the free application for federal student aid or the FAFSA, which launched on October 1st and does so every year. So remember, you do have to complete a FAFSA every year that you're going to be in college. Student financial aid is awarded on a first come first served basis. So submit your FAFSA as soon as possible. Did you know that more than 1 million FAFSAs have already been submitted for next academic year? Get to the head of the line while the money is still available so that you'll be offered the maximum award that you're eligible to receive. And remember to pay close attention to the deadlines. Now your college is going to have a deadline. The state has a deadline for the TOPS scholarship and there are federal deadlines. And I'm sure your counselor has set forth some deadlines for you to complete your FAFSA to meet your graduation requirements. So check with her. Begin the FAFSA process by collecting all of the documents needed to complete the form. And these are going to include the student and parents social security cards, the student and parents 2019 federal income tax returns if you filed, the W-2s because there could be information on this form that's not printed on your tax return, and then your bank statements and records of investments because you must report the balances of these accounts as of the date you submit the FAFSA. You'll want to begin the process by creating your Federal Student Aid ID or FSA ID. This allows you and your parents to electronically sign the FAFSA. The FSA ID is a username and password that you create yourself using your personal information. Each student and one of his parents needs to create an ID. And you can do that at fsaid.ed.gov. Now, make sure you're using your personal email address. Don't use a school email address because that's going to be disabled when you graduate. And then federal student A will not have any way to contact you about your financial aid. And always use your own personal mobile phone number. Don't share any information. Don't use a parent's mobile phone as your alternate number or parents don't do the same. If you don't have an alternate phone number, just leave that field blank. Your username and password is your official electronic signature. So record your FSA ID once you create it and keep it in a safe place. You're gonna use it every year that you complete a FAFSA, which is every year that you're in college. If you don't have access to a computer when you're ready to get started on your FAFSA, just download the FAFSA mobile app. It's called My Student Aid, and you can use it to submit your FAFSA on your mobile device or your mobile phone, any device that has internet access. Or if you prefer, you can use the web-based version at fafsa.gov. Begin the FAFSA by logging in with the student's FSA ID because the FAFSA is the student's application for federal student aid. Mom or dad, your FSA ID will be used to sign the student's FAFSA and also to link to the IRS if you wanna transfer your tax information into your child's FAFSA. It's important to note that the high school class of 2021 should be completing the 2021-2022 FAFSA. Why? Because that is the academic year that you are applying for financial aid. Now, if you're planning to start college early, maybe in the spring or summer semester, you might have to complete both. 
So contact your college to ask that question. There are eight sections that need to be completed before submitting your FAFSA. Start with the student demographic section where you'll be asked to provide the student's social security number, legal name, date of birth, email address, physical address, residency status, and gender. The school selection section where the student will, will report the name of his high school, the colleges that he wants his FAFSA data to be sent to, and the housing plans on each of those campuses. Next is the dependency status section, where you will be asked to report to consider a list of 10 questions to determine whether you are a dependent or an independent student for FAFSA purposes. And they want to know the number of dependents living in the student's household. Next, they're going to ask you for your parents' education. And sometimes parents wonder why they're being asked what level of education they've completed. But remember that there could be additional financial aid on your college campus for first generation college students. Next, you're moving into the parent demographic section where parents will report their social security numbers, their names and marital status and their email addresses. Then you'll move to the parent and student financials. This is where you're going to report your 2019 working wages. Your, uh, you'll be asked if you received any federal benefits. And this is where you're going to report your savings and investment balances. Then it's time to sign and submit the FAFSA. And last, you come to the confirmation page. Now, as you move through the FAFSA, if you need clarification on a question, just click on that question mark beside each question. There are hyperlinks provided. You can request an online chat or call Federal Student Aid. Or if you want to speak with me, you can call Leela's FAFSA helpline. But for this session, I'm going to cover only the most commonly asked FAFSA questions. The citizenship requirement. We get this question pretty often. It's important to note that the student must be a citizen or an eligible non-citizen to complete a FAFSA. If you find yourself in this situation that you're not sure what an eligible non-citizen is, this is a hyperlink within the question and will give you a detailed explanation. Now, if the parents of one of these students um, does not have a social security number, you can go ahead and submit the FAFSA. You'll just want to enter zeros anywhere the parent's social security number is requested. Young men between the ages of 18 and 26 must be registered with Selective Service to be eligible for federal benefits. And because federal student aid is considered a federal benefit, Guys, you have to be registered. Now, this is your choice. If you plan to pay out of pocket for your college education, then that's up to you. I had a young man ask me last week um, how he could register for selective service if he's not 18 yet. And the beauty of this is if you register within the FAFSA, they will hold on to your information until you turn 18 and you will be automatically registered at that time. Only the colleges that you list on the FAFSA in the school selection section are going to consider you for financial aid. They're not just going to push out your personal and financial information to every college around the country. You have to give them permission. So add all of the colleges that you're considering up to 10 at a time and if you plan to apply to more than 10, there's a hyperlink on this page with further instructions on how to do that. Now we're going to move into the dependency status uh, section. And I'm going to quickly go over these items. If you find yourself in one of these situations, you are going to check on it and I'll tell you the results when we finish up. 
Will you be 24 or older by January 1st of the school year for which you're applying for financial aid? Now remember they're asking the students these questions. Are you married or separated but not divorced? Will you be working on a graduate degree? Do you have children who provide more than half, who will receive more than half of their support from you? Or do you have dependents other than children or a spouse who will live with you and receive more than half of their support from you? Are you currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces for purposes other than training? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased? Were you in foster care? Or were you a ward or dependent of the court? Are you an emancipated minor? Or are you in legal guardianship? Now these are two hyperlinks that you might want to check out if you believe yourself to be in this situation. And then the last one, are you an unaccompanied youth who is homeless? or are you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? Now, if you can answer yes to just one of these questions and you can provide a legal document supporting your claim, then you're considered an independent student for FAFSA purposes and you are not required to provide parental information. However, if you cannot answer one of these questions, you are considered dependent and must provide information about your parents. Now, some of you might file your own taxes and perhaps you even live alone, but if you can't answer one of the prior 10 questions, you are still considered a dependent student. One of the top questions we're asked is who's Whose information do I use in the parent section of my FAFSA? And if you live with both of your biological parents, then that's easy. You just list both of those parents. But if the parent you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is separated, divorced, or was never married, you should list that parent on the FAFSA unless that parent is now remarried, and then you should include that parent and his or her spouse. So you can see that federal student aid is trying to get an idea of the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted. Now, if you're identified as a dependent student, but your parents refuse to provide their information on the FAFSA, you can submit your FAFSA without parental information, but you are only going to be offered student loans. So please have a discussion with your parents about this because you want to be considered for any grant monies that you would be eligible to receive. If they still will not provide their information on your FAFSA, go ahead and submit it saying that I'm unable to provide information about my parents, but call the financial aid office or send them an email and tell them you have a special situation that you would like to discuss with them because they can um, put you in an appeal process and begin working through the steps of considering if they can offer you some additional help. Now to make the financial aid office, the financial aid process run a lot smoother and go by quicker, you and your parents, if you filed a return in 2019, should use the internal revenue data retrieval tool. This is going to make sure that your information is accurate and diminish your chances of being selected for verification on your college campus. So grab your 2019 tax return and whatever's on that tax return, you enter it here once you're in the IRS website. Now, what if your tax preparer misspelled your name? 
Put it exactly as it shows on your tax return. What if you've moved since that time? Put your old address here. Spell out street if it's printed that way. Use AVE period if it's printed that way on your tax return. It needs to look exactly the same. Now it's almost time to sign and submit your FAFSA. But before you do, please review your student aid report. This shows every question you were asked on the FAFSA and your answer to each of those questions. Make sure you're sending the financial aid office accurate data, because if not, and you have to go back and make a correction later, that's going to start the process all over for the financial aid administrators. So do yourself a favor and review your report. You can always go back and correct information before you submit. Now, this is where your FSA IDs are going to come in. You see that the student is asked to provide a signature. That's your username and password that you created at the beginning of the process. One parent should sign using his FSA ID and then it's time to submit. Once you press the submit key, you should automatically see this pop up. It is your confirmation page. And although the student is going to receive an email saying that his FAFSA was submitted and is being processed, this is the only time you're going to see this much detail. So do yourself a favor and either print this page or take a screenshot of it and then take a look at the next steps you need to take to complete the student financial aid process. See a list of the colleges that are going to receive your FAFSA data. Review your estimated expected family contribution and consider your financial aid estimates. And I'm gonna emphasize estimates because everybody gets excited when they see the dollar amounts. But these are only estimates based on the information that you manually inputted into your FAFSA. Um, you're going to hear from each of your colleges on how much they are able to offer you in federal student aid. Now, if you begin your FAFSA and submit it, or you begin it, you haven't submitted it, or there are errors, you will receive communication from federal student aid on a weekly or bi-monthly um, basis, telling you that there's further action required. Parents, this email goes directly to the email address listed in the student section of the FAFSA. So make sure that you are encouraging the students to check their email and communicate back with federal student aid. Now, once your FAFSA is fully processed, usually takes three to five days once you submit it, then it's sent on to your colleges. Each college financial aid office will then begin to identify any aid that they might be um, able to offer you. If your family's financial situation has changed since 2019, and unfortunately, especially in Louisiana with everything that's gone on this year, um, you are responsible for contacting the financial aid office to report perhaps some um, income loss, Perhaps one or both of your parents has been laid off or had a reduction in hours worked or some unexpected medical expenses. Because the financial aid office can use their own professional judgment to make some adjustments in their offer, but it's your responsibility to contact them and tell them about their situation. Because they're working, working on determining your net price. And they're gonna do this by looking at their cost of attendance, any grants or scholarships that you're eligible to receive. And the net price is going to be the difference. This is what you're gonna either have to pay out of pocket with in cash 
or by accepting student loans to pay for that academic year. Now, you're going to begin to receive financial aid offers from each of your colleges. So review these because you're going to see that their cost of attendance is listed, any grants, scholarship, work study or student loans that they have to offer you to go to their college will be listed as well. And read over these carefully and respond to any requests they might have of you um, so that they can quickly process your aid. I'm going to remind you again too that you will receive a separate financial aid offer from every school that you've listed on your FAFSA and you've applied to. Some schools wait until you've been admitted uh, for admissions, and then they will begin to work on your financial aid. So be, um, finish up those uh, admissions applications as well. You'll want to accept your financial aid in this order, grants and scholarships first because this is free money that does not have to be repaid. Next, federal work study, because you have earned this money and you don't have to pay this money back. And then your loans, this has to be repaid and with interest. So we want to avoid as much of that as possible. The student financial aid process is explained in detail in our FAFSA completion guide and workbook for the class of 2021, and it's free for Louisiana high school seniors. So if you haven't already received a copy of this, if you will send me an email, I'll be happy to send it on to you, and I'm going to give you my email address and our FAFSA helpline um, number at the end of the presentation. And I'll also include our senior checklist for college planning to help you stay on track this year. Now, let's talk about scholarships for just a minute. These are gift aid that does not have to be repaid and there are thousands of scholarships. Some are offered by your colleges, your parents, employers, nonprofit and community organizations, religious groups, some are merit-based, awarded on your academic achievement or some sort of special talent or interest that you might have. Others are based on financial need. They could cover the entire cost of your tuition or they could be a one-time award of a few hundred dollars. But either way, this is money that you don't have to be repaid. This helps reduce your student loan balance because it is reducing the cost of your education. So talk to your high school counselor or your college financial aid office or admissions recruiter. They have ideas too on where you can find scholarships. This year, we're offering two scholarship opportunities. Louisiana high school seniors who've completed their FAFSA can go to leela.org and grab the $1,000 scholarship application. It's uh, easy to complete. There's no um, essay required. And then once you're a Louisiana college student, you can apply for an additional $1,000 scholarship called the Choose Louisiana Scholarship. That's on our website as well. Now, if you're going to a pricier college and you've exhausted all of your scholarship grants, federal and state dollars, you can go to leelachoice.org and find out more about Leela's nonprofit education loan program. We are always um, available to answer your questions. And if we don't have the answers, we know where to find them. So please feel free to call us on the FLELA FAFSA helpline or send me an email if you'd like to speak to me directly. I'm going to be sending a copy of this presentation to your counselor and we're going to post it on our YouTube channel. It's called Ask Leela. 
So check us out there. And remember to complete your FAFSA as soon as possible. Call if you have questions and apply for Leela's $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship. Have a great senior year.